This is Nursing 622, Module 13, the second half of the psychosocial disorders that we talked about last week. Your learning objectives are to identify the disorders that contribute to the mental status change found in the adult population, the timing of mental status change, treatment, prognosis, and referral of these mental status changes. Again, we look at the autonomy and independence of the patient, the dignity, credibility, and respect, looking at the communication and their sense of belonging. And again, giving them that space that they need to based on touch, their identity, their individuality, so when we talk about delirium, we look at the signal symptoms, the change in mental status, the confusion, disorientation, and again, we're looking at time, place, and person. And then we also look at agitation, which we talked about last week. Are they having those episodes? And have you found a metabolic cause? Or is this more psychosocial? So the description of delirium is a disturbance in the attention awareness. There is a DSM five code for this. The occurrence is usually about 14% in 85 years or older. We see an increased incidence with age, higher incidence in males. This could be metabolic, infectious, cardiac, neuro, pulmonary, all these different things could be secondary, secondary to medications, toxins, exposures. Remember I talked about the alcoholic with hepatic encephalopathy can lead to delirium. This is not uncommon. We talk about delirium tremors with alcohol withdrawal. Again, looking at the etiology and seeing what is the underlying cause. We look at the contributing factors of frailty, signs and symptoms with confusion, easily distractible and at the extreme. Their thinking is disorganized. It does not follow a thought process. They have illusions, hallucinations. We then look at these diagnostic tests, the laboratory studies, the medical records, different information from staff and family to help us formulate this diagnosis. Treatment plan is focused on discovering the cause, preventing complication, ruling out etiologies. Non-pharmacological interventions are important. And then pharmacotherapy. So we need to make sure that we're looking at the medical record, giving information to the staff, the family, looking at the treatment plan, ruling out other etiologies, looking at pharmacotherapy, looking at other medications the patient's on. Prevention and prophylaxis is the elimination or management of the risk factors, correcting those sensory deficits, general supportive me measures, and educating the patient and the families on the etiology and what the expected course of the illness is. We monitor for treatment efficacy, see how they're doing, see if they're improving. Is there an increased risk of injury to self or others? Is there an increased risk of developing complications in older adult patients? Do we need to refer for hospitalization? Is there significant abnormalities or a patient is a harm to themselves or others? And then other specialists. We look at signal symptoms with dementia as confusion, disorientation, impaired short-term memory and cognitive dysfunction. The description is that acquired persistent intellectual impairment with compromised function in multiple spheres of the mental activity. So we have that many mental tests that we also look at. We look at signs and symptoms, they're categorized. We look at the clinical onset because that normally starts with memory loss. Can be mild, can be moderate, can be severe. And then we look at numerous systemic disorders. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. <clears throat> 11% of adults age 65 or older have Alzheimer's dementia. Greatest risk factors are African American and Hispanic, and it's more prevalent in women. So we look at these contributing factors of age, genetics, probable risk factors, and remember, age and genetics are non-modifiable. So knowing that family history is gonna help clue you in with this, and making sure that there's nothing else going on, making sure there's no other differential diagnosis. So we look at the diagnostic tests, we look at the screening tools, the mental status examinations, the cognitive testing. What do you see on physical exam? How do they interact with people? How do they interact with you? Look at that DSM-5 diagnostic criteria, criteria. Treatment can be biological interventions. You can use the psychotherapeutic interventions, social, family, pharmacotherapy. But again, you need to know what medications they're on, what support systems they have, what community resources are available to them. We look at follow-up, which is very close for pharmacotherapy because remember, this is the older population. 
and their side effects and the way they respond to medications are much different than your younger population. Once they are stable on therapy, then you can change it to every three to six months. And in the sequela, the immobility, the swallowing disorders, malnutrition, increased risk of pneumonia, why they're not moving, they're not getting up, going around, they're not understanding things, you have that cognitive impairment. So we need to make sure that we're monitoring their albumin levels, monitoring their electrolytes, <clears throat> making sure they're not malnourished. When we look at prevention and prophylaxis, lifestyle modification, risk factor reduction, again, a referral to the neurologist, geriatric psychiatrist is going to be very helpful. The psychologist, those different support groups, and education, not only of the patient, but of the family or the facility that they're at. Educate them about the disease process and how it can progress, the course of the illness, how it is staged, understanding that there may be things to put need to be put in place, such as advanced directives, power of attorney, that life planning that wasn't in place before. Having a family meeting to discuss these things and preservation of safety. Do we want to keep them in the home? How do we safely do that? Keeping as much independence and autonomy as possible looking at those cognitive behavioral pharmacological therapies to continue with health promotion and continue to follow what the patient's wishes were and what the family is telling you they would like to see for the treatment plan. Elder abuse signal symptoms can be very difficult to detect because remember as they're older you could say oh they fell they have a bruise a broken bone poor personal hygiene, well, she won't let me help her wash, those different things. Oftentimes you see an abrupt change in finances. There's been a family dynamic change. Someone in the family has passed away. They may be the matriarch or the patriarch, and there's a sudden withdrawal with normal activities, unexplained weight loss, excessive power or control by a family member. They won't let the patient answer for themselves. They have to have complete control and want no you to have nothing to do with that patient. Again, when you're looking at some of these physical symptoms, like the withdrawal, the weight loss, make sure there is not a metabolic cause. When you look at the description of elder abuse, this is something that results in harm to an older person or neglect, failing to do something that could result in harm or puts a helpless older person at risk. It can happen in many settings. It can happen in a facility, in the hospital, at home, at a respite facility. Normally there is a lack of close family communication in the past. There is some caregiver stress. There is a high acuity or large amount of patients that they're caring for. It affects one out of every 10 seniors that are over 60 years or higher. Higher incidence is in women. Contributing factors can be social isolation, dependency, that frailty or physical or mental disability that they have. And some people just take advantage of this. When we look at signs and symptoms, we look at those physical signs, the emotional changes, changes in finances and accounts, and then ultimately the evidence of that neglect. So when we're doing diagnostic testing, we look at that head to toe examination, those laboratory studies, those imaging studies, those tests of cognitive ability, making sure there isn't another differential diagnosis and that we're not just saying, oh, they're abused. Well, could they start being having symptoms of dementia or Alzheimer's or their electrolytes are off or they have a urinary tract infection and they're giving family a hard time and that's why they have the disheveled appearance. That's why they have the odor. Make sure you're ruling out a metabolic cause. And then treatment, if you really think it's elder abuse, is reporting that abuse, just like we're mandated reporters with kids, we are with elder abuse. Collect your physical findings. Make sure you have everything well documented, that you have the reports of tests, verbal information from patients and caregivers, looking at collaboration with the interdisciplinary care team that they're involved with. You need to make sure your document is pristine with all of these findings for these patients. Adult Protective Services, is available and you are required to report to them. Are they safe to return home? Should they be returning home if you are concerned that there may be abuse going on? And then education for the caregivers on care of an older adult, how they can cope with it, resources for those caregivers dealing with older patients. 
community offers, and then the caregiver assistant resources that I talked about. So in the sequela, we talk about transfer moving to a safe environment. Are they going to need respite care? Are they going to need to be placed in a facility? Is there legal proceedings that are going to need to occur? We look at prevention and prophylaxis. Again, educating these caregivers and healthcare professionals on how to have coping mechanisms, how to manage these patients, especially if they have dementia or delirium that is chronic. Looking for those community support services. And then your referrals. Your referrals are adult protective. If you can't get anywhere and you do not feel they are safe to go home, you call 911 or the state elder abuse hotline and that is your referral out. Grief and bereavement, when we look at the signal symptoms, there could be none. They may internalize everything. They may have feelings of depression. They may be very obvious with their grief and bereavement. Crying, insomnia, fatigue, anger, sadness, withdrawal. They can also have somatic symptoms like we talked about, headaches, abdominal pain. This is a normal emotional response to loss and grieving. The signs, like I said, change in appetite, sleep disturbance, they withdraw, activities that they'd like to do before, that feeling of depression. This is usually secondary to a loss or change that is perceived as a loss. Most common and significant for older adults, loss of a spouse or a life partner or the loss of independence. Approximately 50% of the women that are older than 65 are widows and 13% of men older than 65 are widowers. Age, gender and ethnicity shows that grief and bereavement affects more women than men. And some of the contributing factors are the length of the illness or if they are the caregiver for their significant other, the relationship quality, or that survivor guilt. Why didn't I die? Why did he have to die? Or why did she have to die? And then that caregiver burden, if they did not pass away, but they've lost their independence and they're not the person that they once knew. They can have this burden and they try to deal and cope with it and try to take care of them, and it can be a lot for them to manage. Again, to do diagnostic testing to make sure it's not depressive episodes secondary to a metabolic syndrome and that you know, we don't have another differential diagnosis that could be contributing to what we think is grief and bereavement. There is treatment plans. There is emotional support, management of sleep disruptions, pharmacotherapy, alternative medicine for this. Return them to their normal routine as soon as possible to help get them back to where they were before. Doing daily physical exercise, close follow making sure you're identifying those support systems and family members, having family meetings. And in the sequela, we know that there's an increased mortality the first three months after the death of a spouse. We see it often. One spouse dies, and then within two to three months, we see the other spouse pass away. Prevention and prophylaxis supported the patient in the normal grieving process, especially if they're dealing with a spouse that has a chronic medical condition or is on palliative care or hospice. And then prevention of dysfunctional grieving, making sure that they're allowed to grieve, but also being able to continue and function with their activities of daily living. And then we talk about insomnia. Insomnia is a difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep despite the desire to do so. This is regardless to adequate conditions to promote sleep, often poor quality sleep, difficulty with daytime functioning, they're fatigued. Signal symptoms could be not sleeping, excessive daytime sleepiness, difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, they're very irritable. Sleep that is refreshing for them. Again, the etiology can be medical. We need to rule out sleep apnea to make sure that's not a reason. Is it behavioral? Is it their circadian rhythm? Did they have a recent hospitalization where they were woken up multiple times at night because of medication or vital signs and they need to get back in their routine? This is often an age-related change where they revert back to almost like we see with infancy where they're up all night and then they're sleeping during the day. It affects approximately 50% of people older than 65 years old. Contributing factors are that restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea, they can have dementia or delirium that keeps them up at night anxiety, different medications. Do we need to make sure they're not taking their diuretic at night and they're up because they're up voiding? Is there other medication that makes them anxious? Are they taking prednisone at night or using an inhaler or other inhaled steroids? We look at drugs and chronic medical conditions to see if there's any component of that that could be contributing to the insomnia. 
When we look at age, gender, and ethnicity, older adults have a greater difficulty falling asleep, staying awake. Women who are divorced or separated or divorced have more insomnia up to the age of 85. Men have more insomnia over the age of 85. The signs and symptoms of the difficulty falling asleep, like I said, or staying asleep, frequent awakenings, daytime fatigue, difficulty concentrating, and then cognitive or psychiatric disease. Are they being medically managed or is this a new onset of a psychosocial disease? There really is no diagnostic test. You look at what the causative agent is. So if you're thinking sleep apnea, then you're going to look towards sleep studies. You're going to look towards that. Differential diagnosis is making sure there isn't anything contributing to the insomnia and then lifestyle changes those pharmacological therapies that we can implement to help them sleep and feel well rested sleep evaluation instruments sleep studies cognitive behavioral therapy and then close follow-up within two to three weeks is recommended then the sequela we notice that there's a decrease in the quality of life because they're not able to function during the day they're much more moody they're fatigued they're falling asleep increased risk of falls or injury motor vehicle accidents, and then the potential for drug dependence. So educating about age-related sleep changes is important. Avoidance of over-the-counter antihistamines because they can have the opposite effect for them. Avoidance of alcohol with prescribed sleep medication due to polypharmacy that can occur with that. And then we look at prevention and prophylaxis. Have a routine. What is your regular bedtime? Decrease your stimuli an hour before you're going to bed. Look at the wake-up time getting up, moving around, avoiding caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine, minimizing your awake time in bed, looking at daily exercise, and then if needed, you refer out to a sleep laboratory to be able to check for sleep apnea. And your references with textbook readings and additional resources.